record button now um, and then we will make that uh, recording available to everybody um, as well at the end of the webinar. All right, so um, just briefly, um, RAC, a bit of a history of it, was um, originally written by a company called Protector Partner. Uh, now they are, um, they, they're experts in the audit field. Many of them came out of the Auditor General's offices um, and they did consulting work for firms across the country, including pre-issuance reviews. Um, and uh, we sat down with them, uh, asked them to go through our methodologies. And in the end, they wrote a new methodology for us based on some of our old methodologies. Now, the idea behind RAC was that we wanted to create an audit methodology that had automation um, so that we could really bring the methodology as a whole into the 21st century, uh, bring in all sorts of uh, new features and things that are possible when you're starting to make use of automation um, in the audit process. Um, and my job when I started out, first thing I did, started four and a half years ago, was I started taking the working papers that Protected Partner were generating for us and putting them into spreadsheets. As you know, DraftWorks is spreadsheet based, but by adding features and tools and automation wherever we could to try and make the flow as logical um, and as user friendly as possible, but at the same time ensuring that we're complying with the ISAs. Now RAC stands for Risk Assessment Per Component. Audits um, in, in recent years more and more have been moving towards following a risk-based approach. We want to see where the risks are in an entity and then we want, we want to go and deal with those specific risks. Um, what tends to happen if you're not doing a proper risk assessment process is you end up doing far too much work. We're over auditing um, and if you, if you start spending too much time auditing things that are not risky, you don't have time to deal with the items in your budget where those risks actually reside and, and where your audit focus should be. So we want to try and identify the risks so that everything else can be done at the lowest possible level of assurance to basically pass the audit at the end of the day. So risk assessments, we'll get through the working papers as we go through, you'll see how we deal with risks, how we address risks and um, how we take take uh, the whole of the ISAs into account in the methodology that we've developed. Now the first thing I want to ask um, for everybody, usually in a, a group it's a bit easier because um, I can look around the audience and see if anybody raises a hand, but the, the question I always ask is um, to start things off, does anybody know what ISA 200 paragraph 19 says? And this is the point at which most people start with a sort of nervous giggle. Uh, they don't really know what to say to that. The, the reason is, is that, well, to quote a paragraph like that is almost impossible. We don't go and memorize the ISAs. However, what ISA 200 paragraph 19 does say is that the auditor shall have an understanding of the entire text of an ISA including its application and other explanatory material to understand its objectives and to pl apply its requirements properly. So basically, you need to know the ISAs. You need to understand an entire ISA. And what we've done with RAC is we're trying to make that the co compliance with that paragraph easier. Because when we go and open up a working paper, and I'm going to start with 10.00, which incidentally is the engagement acceptance document, so that's a good place to start. And what you will see is that immediately we're listing a number of items, in fact paragraphs of various ISAs that are being addressed by this particular working paper. Now as a user, as an audit manager, as an audit clerk, whatever position you might be in, um, in, in, in your firm, if you want to understand what you're doing, what an audit is all about, it's about the ISAs. The ISAs are giving us all the things that we should be doing, considering, thinking about, documenting 
all of that sits in the ISAs. And if you don't know where to find information in the ISAs, you're going to struggle to comply with them because as ISA 200 says, you need to understand the entire text of an ISA. It's very hard in modern day living. Um, I don't know how many of you have read an ISA lately. And again, in, in, a, in a group, usually there are a couple of hands that go up and it's usually the guys that are still studying. So we read the ISAs quite a bit while we're studying, but after that, how often do we really go through those ISAs and go and understand um, what it is that we're supposed to do? We go to technical updates and we get somebody else's opinion on what is important. And much like today, you're going to get my opinion on what's important. Uh, but it's also very important as an auditor to have a, a breadth and depth of knowledge by yourself of the ISAs. And what we're trying to do here is we might tell you things, but go and read the ISA. And here are the paragraphs. And once you've read those paragraphs, that should allow you to understand why you're doing various steps on the working paper. All right, so just a little bit of uh, background in terms of content in RAC. So if I open up the audit programs, you'll see that the first section here is actually 00 to 09 finalization. Now the reason that that's on top of the file is that if the partner looks at absolutely nothing else in the file, hopefully he will at least look at the finalization section. So we put that up front and the idea is that at the end of the day, the audit report is the product that you deliver to your client. If you are permitted to prepare the financial statements in terms of the Companies Act um, and you also prepare the financials, maybe your, the, your, your product that you're delivering is the financial statements as well as that report. But at the end of the day, that most important document should probably be right in front of the file. So this place right in front, if you've got a manual file, section 00, zero there is your um, report or your financial statements, as well as a number of key documents in terms of coming to the conclusion that you have in that report. So the whole of the finalization section deals with things that need to be considered before you can actually issue that report. So if you're starting out the engagement for the first time, you will start in section 10, which is the engagement and team setup. And that's why I got to 10.00, which is the engagement acceptance and continuance document. Now, if we go back to this document, um, I started with the guidance. I showed you where the ISAs were sitting. There's also information in here, including in almost all of our working papers, a hyperlink to a training video on YouTube. So if you're looking for help as to how to um, fill in a particular working paper, what it's supposed to do. There are video links available. Um, I, I can't offhand remember, there's probably something like 40 to 60 different videos um, on our YouTube channel. Many of them are these rack quick videos and there's also comprehensive training on there. There's nine hours of video taking you through the entire rack process. So. Today is not going to be a detailed trading session because we don't have two days to go through everything. This is just to highlight key aspects of the methodology so that you um, can come to grips and understand um, what it looks like. And uh, as I say, about making a decision whether this is right for you if you're in that position. The guidance will also take you through the objectives. Um, you'll see some terminology here like action one. So it's just taking you through some steps maybe and explaining practically how to go about filling in various items. Um, but main thing starts when we hit the working paper and here is 10.00.01. Now when you open up the working paper for the first time, the heading will be exposed and you will see various details. We have just gone about including a little grouping here much like you would open or close the grouping in the financial statements so that you can um, get a little bit more space in your screen. Sometimes some of these questions in RAC uh, go on for quite a bit and um, it might be difficult to read if you don't start making space for yourself. And if you do have a low resolution screen, you can also double click on the ribbon bar and that will also hide and allow you uh, to see more stuff in your working paper if you are in need of any space. Just double click and it will come on again.
All right, so I've closed the grouping. We don't really need to see who's prepared and reviewed at this point. We want to start documenting. Now, the color layout within Rack is uh, pretty important. So I just want to quickly go and delete the response there so that you can just see um, what happens. And so right now we have got um, a yellow cell, we've got some green cells, and we've got some grays. And the colors within Rack um, are geared towards trying to draw your attention to specific locations um, and to understand where you actually need to go and complete information. So the yellow cells are compulsory input cells. There is information that needs to be inserted into this working paper, um, which if you don't insert it will affect the working papers going forward. So the first question here is, is this engagement a new engagement or a continuing engagement? And the option is just a simple drop down, new or continuing. And if I say a new engagement, what implications this has on my file is that um, you now need to go and ask your client's permission to contact the predecessor auditor. You need to go and if allowed, have an interview with them. Maybe look at some documentation, depending on what they'll allow you to look at and see and, and what have you. If your client doesn't allow you, now this is all coming out of the ISAs. So there we've got a template. You'll see that this hyperlink popped up. I can just simply click on that hyperlink. It opens up 10.00. Right, this is all coming out of ISA 510. And here are the questions to go and consider, discuss, document information about the predecessor auditor. All right. Now, what happens if it's a continuing engagement? None of this stuff is applicable. So in order to facilitate that and to in order that you don't end up doing work you shouldn't be, once I select continuing in this cell and I go back to 10.00, you'll see that this entire working paper has fallen away. There's nothing in here anymore. And all it says is that since this is a continuing engagement, this document is not applicable. And if you know about the electronic sign-offs in DraftWorks, you can just go and say, click simply set as not applicable. And that's when this working paper will now be highlighted in blue in your audit program. And you will know then as a reviewer, as a manager, uh, that you don't need to worry about that working paper because there's nothing applicable sitting in there. Okay, so that document falls away. All right, so let's go back to 10.00. We filled in the compulsory input field. Now, please don't confuse the fact that the rest of these cells are not yellow as thinking that they're not important. Um, the compulsory is related to methodology uh, documents and requirements and information that we need to make the formulas work. These green areas are where we are expecting some form of user input. Now, you might decide that the question is not applicable. Um, now, in this particular document, it's probably best to then document the fact that it's not applicable. But there are other working papers as we go through where you will see these green cells and you may just decide to leave it blank um, or you could just go and put in an NA, whatever the case might be, whatever is applicable for you and your client you'd need to just go and complete the appropriate. The initials and date, uh, that quite simply is just there so that as you go through, you can then use this little button on the left-hand side, initials, sorry, on the right-hand side, getting my left and right mixed up this morning. Click on that and it inserts your initials and the date to show that you have performed that step. And that's important to understand, this, distinguish that from this button, which is set as prepared, which electronically signs the entire working paper off as prepared. Okay, so there's an initials and date, which is allows you just to sign off a step. It might be different people completing different steps in this working paper, or you might want to sign off the entire working paper as a whole. All right, as we scroll down, there are other questions sitting in here um, that come out as yellow. I just want to go back to... Uh, change one of these values here quickly so that you can just see what it looks like. Okay, so we've got a question down here about the EQCR, which is the Engagement Quality Control Review, and we've got a little assessment working paper where you can go and put in your firm's requirements for when an EQCR is required, 
so that you can test this client against those EQCR requirements. We've also got a little questionnaire to help you determine the PIS score. At the moment it's highlighted in yellow, that's what I went to go and change quickly. We only sign this off or show this cell as green once you have actually gone and completed all of the fields in the PIS calculation. There's just a risk that you might forget. If I get to this point and I assess, oh gee whiz, okay it's 291, um, that's less than 350 so I'm going to do this type of audit. But in fact you've missed a key item which is 130 million rands in revenue and suddenly you've made the wrong decisions because your PIS score was wrong. So the, the number does not finalize until such time as you have completed all the cells. It's also got a questionnaire to assist you with um, what type of engagement, firstly from the Companies Act. Um, so this first question here is, is the entity required to be audited in terms of its memorandum of incorporation? If I remove that question or that answer, you'll see that a whole lot of cells are highlighted yellow because I need to complete these items in order to assess the engagement properly. However, if the MOI says yes you must be audited, well then there is nothing else applicable anymore and that's why we then complete everything else as not applicable for you because the MOI says yes you must audit, we assess it and say yes you must audit. Okay? We've got a couple of questions about um, section 92 being mandatory for the audit. Um, how many years the same partner has been involved in the audit and that's really just to document that information so that you can test yourself against your firm's policies on partner rotation within the firm. And then we've got the indicators. So the first block here is about all the indicators to indicate when an audit is required and if any one of these questions is yes then you must audit. We've then also got a set of blocks which look at the independent review exemption. So if all the shareholders of the companies are directors and the PIS score is less than 100 or less than 350 but the AFS are independently compiled, um, then you may apply the independent review exemption except if the entity has um, uh, required voluntarily or by other law. So the MOI or um, for instance the Estate Agent Affairs Board, your PIS score could be one in an estate agent but the law requires that you audit so then that will not apply. So in this case you need a yes for all three of these items. So you're not required to have a review or an audit by some other law you, or independently those PIS score and the companies are also directors. Okay. Then uh, 92B there's also an assessment. Any one of these means that you have to apply section 92B. So once again this yes comes up and you'll see that at the bottom there's a bit of a conclusion which is then carried over to that first sheet. Section 92B must apply to this entity and an audit is required is also listed over there and that value is then taken for you across. So other colors you'll see these white cells there's not a user input required but we are calculating the value in the white cells whereas the green cells is where we would expect some user input. So if you're a reviewer don't ignore the white cells but it's not a user input field it's a value that's determined by some sort of a formula whereas the green and yellow are where we're looking for some information. Okay. All right, then there is also an assessment at the bottom whether or not you want to accept that client. This also highlights yellow if you've not completed it. Um, and the, the, it's a bit of a circular document, the engagement acceptance document, because um, thinking back to my trainee days, you theoretically can't open a file until such time as you have accepted the client. But unfortunately, the templates that you need to assess the client are sitting within the file. So we are saying here that in 10.00 you're documenting information that you have already considered beforehand um, but now you've got a place to document it in the file so that the information that you document can be used effectively through the audit such as the PIS score which is help which, which you, we use to help 
determine sample size, such as whether it's a new or continuing engagement, which we use to determine whether or not you need to do a full assessment of opening balances or a more basic assessment of opening balances and the predecessor auditor. Okay. All right, so that's quite a bit on that one working paper, um, but there are just elements in there that you're now going to see throughout the um, throughout the file as as we as we work through Rack. Right, I want to open up 10.02, which is the audit firm's independence. Now, independence, very very important concept, and uh, so we've got a questionnaire here to go and take you through. Um, considerations in terms of ISQC1 and the ISAs uh, of what potential conflict of interest might exist. So now in this first cell you'll see it says um, or asks the question do we have financial interests in the client? Okay. Now I've answered that question with a yes and as soon as you see a yes as you would see in these two lower items it's going to highlight the cells on the right in yellow, indicating that there is a compulsory input that we need to put in here. And what's the compulsory input? We've got to document the reason behind the prohibition, and we've got to document the actions taken to eliminate or reduce the threat to an acceptable level. All right, now, unfortunately, Excel and spreadsheets are not clever enough yet for me to be able to determine whether the content in the cell is intelligent or not. But as a reviewer, I think you will see that as you are reviewing a working paper, this green is going to stick out. Even if somebody writes garbage, you're not going to miss these cells because the green is highlighting it for you quite nicely and you'll be able to pick up um, on any issues. And I'm deliberately leaving a few yellow cells and a few unanswered questions because I want to show you um, how we use information in Rack when we get to another working paper. And um, the information throughout this engagement and team setup is actually summarized in a little engagement setup sign-off document. Now this document basically just goes through um, various items or the various working papers that have preceded um, this working paper in the file and it is summarizing a few key aspects of each. So if we go and have a look at 10.02, all right, we see here audit firm's independence, has the partner signed off the audit firm's independence and it tells me no. So in other words, I've not yet signed off this document as prepared or reviewed. So no, the document is not signed off. And please note that there are five incomplete questions. Please note that there are three deviations noted. In three of those deviations, insufficient reasons and actions were recorded. So the fact that I have unanswered questions is being reported to you on this little summary document. And these summary documents are really intended to be kind of review helpers. So as the partner or manager, you can quickly come and get an idea of where things are sitting in the file. Um, and Leon. if you see gaps like this, you can go back to that working paper. 10.25, I was saying, is a summary document. It's pulling all this information in from other working papers. So you can see that there is information being gathered in other places and, and, and put onto this working paper. And with RAC, that's what we have intended to do. We wanted to create a platform and a mechanism and a methodology basically that is doing exactly that. It's taking information that you're documenting in working paper A and using it in some meaningful way in working paper B. Now one of the most important documents in the entire setup process is 10.20 which is the working paper where you go and identify various um, sections that you need to go and actually audit in this file. Now the reason for this document is that within RAC there are up to 27 different audit programs. Now you don't want to go and complete 27 audit programs if you don't need to complete 27 audit programs. So what we try and do on this working paper is we go and as far as possible gather the balances from the key components in your financial statements. 
So you'll see things like revenue, investment income, other income, cost of sales, payroll, other expenses. Um, so there's a couple of line items out of my trial balance and it goes and checks whether this value is quantitatively material. Now before we do 10.20 there is a uh, materiality working paper 10.10 .10, and in that document you will go and document what the materiality is I, th I think it's about 1.5 million so this little cell all it's doing is it's saying well is this value more than materiality and in this case absolutely that's more than 1.5 million so it is quantitatively material all right the question arises though is what do you do with balances like investment income here we have 16 rands, all right? Is it quantitatively material? And definitely no, because that is not more than a material amount, okay? Now, I've inserted these values a little earlier, so I'm just pulling them out here quickly. The next question we have to ask is, is this balance qualitatively material? Now, everywhere where you have a balance that's not material, it's gonna highlight the cells in yellow like it did here, okay? And as soon as you complete it, it goes back to green. So is the, the balance of investment income qualitatively material? And this largely depends on professional judgment. Now that 16, I would say, is not qualitatively material. And in that case, I can say, I'm not going to audit this balance, okay? Now we go down a little bit further, we get to depreciation. We say this is quantitative material, yes or no, that's calculated for you. But is this qualitatively material? Now the fact is that there's a zero balance in the current year. There's a bit of a balance last year. So there's an indication here that maybe the client has not done the journals necessary to account for depreciation correctly. But um, I would at this point go and say the the problem with not testing depreciation is that when we get to our fixed assets, it's going to be more difficult to test those fixed assets. So on that basis, I might decide, and because depreciation is an estimate, I might decide that this is qualitatively material. And as soon as one of these items is yes, I cannot say I'm not going to audit it. I have to audit this balance. And you'll see that red cell, first time you've seen red, is there to indicate an error. There is something wrong um, in the value that I have inserted. So I'm going to go and make that a yes, and I will now audit depreciation. Okay. Investment income, 16. It's not quantitatively material. It's not qualitatively material. And the justification behind this assessment is the likelihood of that 16 being materially misstated is probably exceptionally, exceptionally low. However, there is one way that the 16 can be materially misstated, and that is if it is understated. So if it's overstated by 16, the balance of investment income is zero. So the maximum difference is 16, which is not material. So I'm not going to go and test the existence of that 16. But we have gone and incorporated a working paper which sits under section 70 of your audit programs. I'm just going to show you where that where it sits. I'm not going to actually open it now. Anything that you indicate you will not audit when you're working on 10.20 will be automatically transferred to this overall completeness working paper. And there it will give you the opportunity to identify a couple of completeness procedures for each of these balances that you don't audit, um, just so that you have got assurance that you've covered yourself just from a completeness point of view. Because the risk is that these guys have got investments and actually they made 16 million rands in dividends. And because they're and they're funneling that money into their own pockets instead of letting those dividends be deposited into uh, the business bank account. Um, so they're running off and avoiding taxes and what have you. Um, but um, yeah, that that uh, that is a risk. That completeness in this case is a risk, and so we will go and consider completeness.
Now it'll also, as we go through, I want to point out things like the tax expense. All right, tax expense is zero. All right, but we can't not audit tax expense because we have to go and do a tax calculation. So it does require a little bit of um, sort of professional judgment and experience in terms of determining um, what needs to uh, what needs to be included. Uh, but um, yeah, it's it's really you need to decide what's applicable for your audit for your client. Um, you don't want biological assets where there are no biological assets at the client, for instance, and that's what we're trying to prevent. We don't want to um, getting uh, we we don't want to get um, waste waste space waste time throughout the audit. Okay, all right. So just while while I'm at it, I just note there is a question about adding uh, new components to this working paper. Okay, so um, in this working paper, you will see that there are a number of line items at the bottom, additional class of transaction. Below the balance sheet items, there are also a number of additional uh, uh, account balance items that you go, can go and manually add. All right. Now, in this version of the template, um, you would go and adjust the balances in the leads, or you can simply go and type in the relevant balances and update the balances in these cells automatically. Um, in the newer version of 10.20 that we released the other day, there is also a way of linking um, lead schedules to these balances. Uh, so we will release an updated video uh, in the coming weeks just to show you how that new 10.20 works. It would require you to go and just create a new custom lead to put those balances separately so that it's easier to audit. Or alternatively, you can just simply go and update the formulas here. Let's say you want to create two different classes of revenue or two additional classes of revenue. You can go and create those, fill in the values or the formula, and then just subtract it edit the formula here so you'll see that there is just a formula um, in place so you can update those formulas or overwrite it whatever the case is remember this is a planning document if the values change slightly that's not really critical unless the balance suddenly becomes material but that you'd need to just assess um, with your analytical reviews and probably your final analytical review as well uh, but most important just to, to get the right components. And then what that'll do is as you add separate components, you would be able to allocate these to different audit sections. So as we go further, let me just take you through the other questions that are sitting in here. And I want to go to property plant and equipment specifically. All right, now you'll see that here is also a question about accounting estimates. All right, every single component or not every single, but many components may be in some way subject to some form of estimation. Depreciation is an estimate because it relies on a judgment call. What is the useful life? What is the residual value? Is there any impairment? And um, ISA 240 has quite a lot to say about estimates. Why? Because estimates are one of the ways that management can override controls. They go and make an estimate that depreciation is massive, and in that way they reduce profits. Um, okay, that won't have a tax effect, but there could be a reason for that. The, the other way around applies too. They try and overvalue the assets by not impairing them, by depreciating them over a million years instead of 10, um, and in that way overstating their assets to try and put their balance sheet in a better position. There are a number of estimates that influence the file, and in 10.20, you need to go and identify those estimates. And I'll show you in a moment where these estimates pop out. What also comes up is a section reference. And in this case, it's showing that property plant and equipment is section 30. And the idea is that as you identify areas that need to be audited, and let me go and add a yes here to investment property, I can, and you'll see immediately that the section reference 30 has popped up for investment property. Okay, it's part of the same cycle. And that's the next thing to look at is our business cycles. All right, so there's a sheet here for cycles. What we've done in RAC is we've tried to move away from a separate audit program for every component. Now, initially, the reasoning behind this was you sit in a position where you need to go and audit revenue, 
and you need to audit trade receivables. And you give clock A the, the, the revenue section and clock B the trade receivable section. They're actually auditing the same transactions. The um, trade receivables is just the balances at the end of the year as to what people still owe you, but the revenue is also going through on a day-to-day -day basis through that trade, those trade receivables accounts. So what happens is these two clocks go and um, ask the same question of the same person um, during the audit. And you've got one debtor's clock who is then inundated with the same question multiple times. And um, what, do they, what do they do? They think we're not, we're not talking to each other. So the idea behind cycles is to go and lump the cycle together so that you can keep things like your cycle description, your, your system description in one place, and then you can also start designing procedures that are addressing more than one component at the same time. So you might come up with a procedure um, that um, addresses both revenue and receivables, and you do that procedure once instead of multiple times. Okay, so um, here you can then go and customize those components or cycles. So I'm scrolling down and you'll see I've got inventory and if I scroll a little bit further down to the trade and other payables you'll see cost of sales is included under trade and other payables. Now that's not always the right place to have cost of sales. Cost of sales is either run or should I say inventory is either run on a perpetual or a periodic. Now if it's periodic what is happening is as you purchase the inventory you debit cost of sales, credit creditors or bank, whatever the case might be, and at the end of the month you do a stock take and you do a journal out of cost of sales into inventory. So then as a cycle, cost of sales is running largely like expenses because the debits for every single purchase of goods is going through cost of sales. And it's probably going to be quite easy to audit cost of sales and other expenses together and then when you get to inventory, you can deal with those journals coming out of cost of sales. So the debits will run quite easily under trade and other payables. However, if you're using the uh, perpetual inventory system, when you purchase cost of sales, it is going to the inventory account. Or sorry, when, or when you purchase goods, it goes to inventory. And when you make a sale, then a journal goes or an entry goes through cost of sales. So if you want to move the cost of sales elsewhere, you can simply go to the drop down list here, make that blank and have a look at the top. It's immediately highlighting the fact that something has not been assigned. It says cost of sales um, has not been allocated to a cycle. And I just want to show you on the components sheet as well that it then highlights the section reference in yellow too. So if you're seeing any section references come up in yellow, it's because it's not yet been assigned to a cycle. Let's go back, we want to assign this now, and I want to assign this item to my, in, to my inventory section. Hit the drop down, select cost of sales, and now cost of sales will be on the same audit program as my inventory working paper. Okay. All right, there's a, there's a lot more um, to this document and that's why as I say we've got those training videos to take you through the working paper um, and uh, that'll guide you through understanding what is going on here and I'll just show you the link of the estimates in a moment to um, to understand where those estimates are going as well okay all right let's go and have a look at the next one and that is 12 point. 10. All right, so 12.10 is sitting now in what we call the planning and risk identification section of the audit. Okay. Now planning and risk identification, very, very clearly and uh, specifically chosen word, 
we're looking for risks. That is what planning of the audit is about. We're, we're trying to identify um, risks and in that way allow us to design audit procedures and processes to address the specific risks. So when you're doing the planning, you're documenting a lot of information about the client, about your knowledge of the business. And as you're documenting that knowledge, you can start assessing and understanding whether um, the uh, whether that knowledge that you've gained is any in any way indicating some form of risk. And that's exactly how we've laid out many of the working papers in section 11 and 12. And I'm specifically looking at 12.10 because it's one of the longer ones um, to go and understand and um, have a look at the layout of the working paper. We've got a question here on the nature of the entity, we look at ownership, we ask questions about the date incorporated here, there's some owners and principal shareholders, there's a question on the group structure, and then we go and we specifically lay out what possible risk factors are there. So we suggest a few possible ones which you can use or don't use at, at your discretion. Or you can, as you can see here, that's not the original content here. We didn't send out the template with um, edit risk um, just for fun as, uh, as the actual risk factor. But you can go and edit these risks, the wording in these risks. And you then need to go and identify whether or not this risk is applicable to your entity. Some of the working papers in section 12 and 11, all they'll have is a space for you to document that risk. This one specifically is highlighting a few. Um, it's just helpful in terms of what you're gathering in terms of knowledge of the business to link these risks to those items. But just to show you, I'm going to delete the contents here. As soon as I say yes, there's a risk, it's going to ask me, is it a business or fraud risk? And you'll see that it's highlighting in, in yellow. It's very important to document the fact of uh, whether it's a business or fraud because we treat business and fraud risks separately. Now, a fraud risk, by definition, is a misstatement or misappropriation of assets which is uh, performed or done with intent by management. It's not an accidental error. It is management has intentionally misstated the financial statements or misappropriated assets. And as soon as management is involved in that, it is a fraud risk. Everything else is a business risk. That's basically how this works. Okay, so if you are seeing management intent, then it is a fraud risk, else it is business. Now the ISIS tell us that a fraud risk is significant. It doesn't matter if it causes a two rand error. If it's management intent, it is fraud, and you've even got to go as far as start considering is this a reportable irregularity. Okay. The other thing that is slightly different on this working paper is you might notice, depending on your resolutions, and um, I know some people struggle with colors, but um, there are light blue cells here rather than green cells. Okay. Now these light blue cells are roll forward cells. And that's another um, advance we've brought into Rack that um, is uh, basically better than our previous methodologies is that for the first time um, you can carry information over from one year to another without the need to carry the entire working paper as well. So I'm just going to quickly go and um, I'm sure you've noticed that if you've used Rack there isn't a formula bar and we specifically hide the formula bar in Rack because if I show the formula bar and I've selected the cell, you'll notice that there's quite a complex little formula sitting in there. Don't worry about the formula. The formula is there to pull the data from prior year. So the way we've designed the template is that when you do a roll forward, you take none of these files with you. No audit programs, nothing under planning and risk identification, no finalization documents. There's nothing in this file that you actually carry forward. The only working papers you may want to carry forward 
is those working papers uh, which you've introduced to the file, such as fixed asset registers or um, a working paper on, on receivables that you like, that you'd like to update next year, documentation about controls if you've put separate documentation in, prior year financials, those things you can roll forward, but everything else does not need to be rolled forward. Rolled forward. What happens is we will put a brand new version of, say in this case, 12.10, into your working paper next year and even if question one is now question five this formula will remain the same and it will still be able to go and pull the relevant information out of the database for last year so when you are preparing this working paper don't worry about the fact that there's a formula in there go and document who the owner is and next year that information will be there. Right now, switch on the formula bar, you'll see it's no longer got a formula in there. But next year the formula will be in there and the value will be in there. So look out for these roll forward cells. If you are thinking of adopting Rack, there will be a time cost to get it going in year one because you've got to go and complete this information. But that is why we've built these roll forward cells is specifically so that you don't need to redocument common information year after year after year. If ownership changes, by all means, go and override that formula again next year. So it's not now done forever. There might be changes, but you don't have to go and redocument the entire working paper. And uh, depending on your internet connection, I'm not sure how much of this you'll see as I scroll. This working paper is exceptionally long. Okay. Um, there's a lot of information that, that is gathered in this working paper based on the requirements and the ISAs, based on sort of practical um, knowledge of, of what is required in audits about asking your questions specifically to try and pull out are there risks here because remember that's what we're doing. But there's also the likelihood that as you're going through all of these 41 questions, there are going to be items here that are really not applicable to your audit and what you simply then need to do is go to the cell and type NA in a blue cell and what happens next year that not applicable will be there already for you so unless something has changed and you now required information in the cell um, you don't need to go and redocument all these not applicables in the following year all right the other thing that we've brought into rack um, which I haven't spoken about yet, is scaling. So there are 41 questions sitting on 12.10, and it's very hard to go and decide which questions are valid and invalid um, on any sort of formularized basis. So it's very hard to go and say, well, because we have a motor industry, you, only, you can skip question 8 and 9, because uh, I, I did my um, articles at a firm in, uh, in the low felt, worked for four and a half years as an audit manager and uh, we had a client where they had Buffalo on the um, balance sheet and it was a lawyer. So yeah, you have a law firm and there are Buffalo biological assets that you need to carry at fair value each year, get a price from the, the, the latest auctions um, and um, it's just weird. So how can I assume that there are questions that I can just switch off? Uh, it's maybe a silly example, but, but that's the reality uh, behind audits. The, an audit is an audit. You can't change the questions. If I go to the guidance sheet on this working paper, there are a lot of ISAs being addressed in this working paper. Okay, and that's why the questions are there, because the ISAs are guiding us towards this. We can't just go and assume I can switch things off. However, we do also appreciate the fact that not every audit is a big listed entity. And for that reason, we wanted to create some ability to scale these working papers. And so we've actually got four different file sizes. So there are a few key working papers, one of which is 12.10, where we do start switching off some questions based on the size of the client. So from a large to a medium client, we're going to start switching off things about consolidations or group entities which, which are more dealing with listed information 
and we go all the way down to the smallest being at what we call Rack Micro. And Rack Micro is there for voluntary audits. We also appreciate the fact that as a firm, you don't want to go and have three or four different methodologies for different file types. Rack is one methodology. You want to plow your resources, your understanding and your knowledge into one methodology, but then you want to be able to apply it slightly differently. And I want to show you, if you'll excuse a few um, random values and characters around the sides of this working paper, but this is the entirety of the Rack Micro version of your Knowledge of the Business document. What we've basically done is we've said, well, we're dealing with a really small entity here that's a voluntary audit where they don't have sophisticated systems and controls and processes. It's owner managed. Um, it's maybe not even a company. It's a trust or, um, or, or something like that where what do, you, what do you know about it? This. You can just document in a couple of quick paragraphs your entire knowledge and in terms of understanding the nature of the entity. You can then still go and document any risks that you're identifying, but the core issue here is that we're reducing the workload by not giving you 41 questions, but rather space to go and fill this in. Now, the reason that we've adopted this, um, this approach, or uh, let me rephrase that slightly, um, we don't want you to do Rack Micro with every single entity. You need to then understand, if you're doing Rack Micro, the kind of information that needs to be gathered. And in this case, understanding what the ISA says becomes a lot more important because if you document irrelevant information about the nature of the entity here and therefore don't address the standards, and for some reason that file is reviewed, although Uber has indicated to me that they're unlikely to select a voluntary audit um, for a file review. I don't know every circumstance, so don't hold me to that. Um, but if something goes wrong or um, for whatever reason, that might not be sufficient anymore. So if, if you don't know and understand what you need to put in there, you can get yourself into a little bit of trouble. Uh, so please use Rack Micro wisely and just understand as a firm when, how, and why you would apply it, what the circumstances are, um, and just do so with discernment, with professional judgment. Okay, the next document I want to quickly look at is 12.70, which comes back to those estimates. Now, ISA 240 is pretty clear about what needs to be um, done about management override controls. Um, and in fact, ISA 240 lists a couple of items. And this is one of the few places at the moment where we've gone and documented or specifically inserted copy and paste out of the ISA. And ISA 240 tells us that we need to make a presumption of a fraud risk related to revenue. That shouldn't come as a surprise to anybody. Um, this is uh, it's been around for quite a while. If you have revenue, which hopefully every company does, except maybe a few investment holding companies. Um, you've got revenue, you have got a fraud risk, unless you can prove otherwise. So what this working paper does in this revenue tab is, it again, it just tells you the information from the ISA, and the ISA is telling you that you can, you have to make this presumption, but you might be able to argue that it is, um, it's not a fraud risk for whatever reason. But then you need to document, and what this working paper is doing is giving you the opportunity. So it's asking you, based on the above, are there valid reasons within this entity to rebut the presumption of revenue as a fraud risk? Now, if you say no, that's it. Revenue is a fraud risk. There's, there's no question about it, and it's immediately going to be taken to your fraud risk register, which we'd look at in a moment. However, if you say yes, there are valid reasons it gives you space to go and document that reasoning. And for each item, you can go and say whether or not the reason that, reasoning that you've given is deemed sufficient. The other thing that's important to note is that we're not dealing with just completeness here, okay, or classification. Um, all of the assertions are 
potentially impacted by this revenue fraud risk. So you need to go and document reasoning. Even if you document it once for everything, that's fine. Uh, but the point is we're giving you space to document for all the assertions. Don't assume that it's only one item. So firstly, rebuttable presumption, revenue fraud risk. Secondly, fraud risk related to management's ability to override controls. And the ISA tells us to test journal entries, review accounting estimates for bias, and review significant transactions outside the normal course of business. Okay, so we've got to go and review estimates. And that's why those estimates were popping up in 10.20, where we were asking per component, what estimates are there? And so here you need to go and do procedures, document those procedures, and at the end of the day, decide whether or not you still want to maintain a fraud risk related to those estimates. And if you do carry that fraud risk over, it again will automatically populate to your fraud risk register. Okay. Now the procedures again are outlined in the ISAs. This is word for word out of the ISA. We need to evaluate the judgments and decisions made by management in making the accounting estimates included in the financial statements. Even if they are individually reasonable, indicate a possible bias on the part of entities management that may present a risk of material misstatement due to fraud. If so, the auditor shall reevaluate the accounting estimates taken as a whole. Okay, so first step is we need to go and assess A, firstly, is this reasonable, but then also as a whole, amongst all the estimates. Is there some bias? Is there some bias to start overstating assets, overstating revenue, maybe understating profits to avoid taxes? And then procedure B is basically a reperformance of that for a prior, prior year. So it's a retrospective review of management's judgments and assumptions related to significant accounting estimates reflected in the financial statements of the prior year. Okay. All right. So that's, that is estimates. That's why we're why it's why we're asking the question about estimates in 10.20 and we're giving you the opportunity to document and assess those estimates in this working paper. If you find that there is no fraud risk, you will still do an audit on depreciation and useful lives and residual values and impairment. That will still form part of your standard procedures under property plan and equipment. But it will not be at a significant level of assurance. It will be at a lower level of assurance depending on what you've decided as the overall assurance within the file. Okay, so once you have done the whole of section 11 and 12, we get to a document here called the risk assessment sign-off, and that is similar to the 10.25 document we looked at earlier, just a place which gathers information from the previous working papers. In this case, it's mostly just looking at sign-offs, but 12.95 is particularly important because Without 12.95 being appropriately signed off, you won't be able to generate audit programs. So we, the, the template itself, when you create a new RAC file, won't have any audit programs except for journals. And you need to go and get through the planning before you populate those audit programs. And the reason behind that was, as I said earlier, there are up to 27 different audit programs available. And you don't want to have to go through 27 sections of the audit file to switch off and mark as not applicable all these audit programs if you don't need to. So in this case, you will not see a biological asset section in this file because there are no biological assets. Now I have already populated the audit programs, so those audit programs are, are already in the file. Um, but ordinarily there would be nothing, there wouldn't even be a section 30 because there are no other working papers sitting in section 30. Um, it's just the index and the audit program. Okay, but once we've populated the audit programs, we haven't finished with our risks yet. We still need to go and assess the risks. So 11 and 12 is identifying the risks, 15 and 16 is assessing those risks and we've split it between the fraud and the business, and you'll see it's the fraud rack, the business rack, because now we are going to assess the risk per component in the file. So I'm just going to take a look at 1505. The two documents are fairly similar. Um, the key difference being just that with business risks, we don't automatically assume that it's significant. 
there are a couple of other minor differences, but again, um, go through the video and it'll it'll indicate exactly uh, what you need to do in 1605 versus 1505. All right, so uh, sorry, I just need to go to planning sign off, change a value here quickly. That's already in. That's already been signed off, so the working paper looks a bit different. Okay, here we go. All right, so firstly, the ISA 240 risks are listed here automatically. Scroll a bit down. I'm not going to go through those. I want to go through other risks that I've identified. Okay, so please excuse my um, random typing. It's hard when you're in a hurry to uh, think of a meaningful sentence. So that's why I have things like edit risk for fun and, um, well, I can't pronounce that next line. But uh, here are some risks that I've raised in 12.10. Now, what we've, do you see what we've tried to do is as you're documenting your knowledge of the business, you're automatically at the same time documenting your risks on that working paper. So that when you're trying to review the file, you can immediately see what risks have been raised in the working paper itself without having to refer back to a register the whole time. The risk is there, it's available, it's visible, um, and, and you can see it on the working paper. But we can't do the entire assessment on each working paper, so now we automatically carry over all the risks from the various files and we drop them into 1505 for fraud risks, 1605 for business risks, and we can now start the assessment process. First question next to each risk is, can this risk be related to specific components or assertions? And in other words, what we're asking about here is, is this a financial statement level risk or an assertion level risk? And you'll see if I say no, all of these cells are marked in black. And the reason is that we don't need to now assess which class of transaction account balance disclosure and assertions are affected because they're not. We're saying it's a financial statement level risk, not an assertion level risk. Okay. You would then go and start documenting what components are affected and only those components that you've selected to audit are visible. That's probably not visible on your working pa or on your screens, um, on, on the file. You might not see it so well in the recording either, if you're watching the recording, uh, but um, this is the different components. And you simply go and say yes to all of those that are affected. We then also need to go and consider assertions. Okay, now I just wanna show you a few things. Firstly, I wanna go and delete property plant and equipment and I wanna delete the assertions. Okay, so if I've just gone and selected first risk, revenue is the component, and now I need to go and look at the assertions you'll see that all the assertions are highlighted in yellow except the one, which is rights and obligations. Rights and obligations is an account balance assertion. So if I try and say yes to that, it's wrong. There is no such thing as rights and obligations of revenue. So I can't select that item. But I can go and select cutoff. And you'll see that all the cells go blue. Okay, and blue, important this will roll forward into future years. Okay, let me go now add properly plant and equipment and you'll see the cells go yellow again. And the reason is, is that while cutoff is appropriate for revenue, it's not an appropriate assertion for property plant equipment. So now I need to go back and switch on that rights and obligations again, if, if that's a valid one. Obviously if it's not rights and obligations, it could be completeness. You'll see the cells will color themselves blue again. So we're very carefully looking at the assertions that you're selecting based on the components you've selected to make sure that you're making appropriate selections throughout the process. Okay, where you have a financial statement level risk, quite simply, there's a drop down. And uh, the reason there's a drop down is that the ISA tells us what needs to be done when you have financial statement level risks. So you would just select one of these items and then go and provide a description about how practically you are going to implement this requirement. Then for all risks, we're looking for management response. And again, unfortunately, I can't look for an intelligent answer. I can just look for an answer. But again, you will 
quickly pick up if somebody's um, typing rubbish, hopefully. Then, the ISAs are quite clear, where we have a significant risk, we must document a control, and we must do a walkthrough. So here, those ISAs, are, those, those requirements are covered directly in our fraud risk register, or our fraud rack. And then we have a question about whether or not this fraud risk still exists. And the, the reasoning behind this is that while you were doing the planning, you documented your knowledge of the business, and you decided that there was a fraud risk. Now you come to this working paper, you allocate it to the various components and assertions, and the next step is you document a control, and you do a walkthrough, and you get management's comments about this risk. At this point, you might say, well, now that I know this, which I didn't know when I was doing my planning, I don't think this is a fraud risk anymore. And you have the option now of saying, no, this is no longer a fraud risk, and that's it. The fraud risk is gone. What we don't want is for you to go back to the working paper 12.10 and delete the risk there. And the reason for that is if somebody reviews that file and they review what you've documented about the client, they may also initially come to the conclusion that there is a potential fraud risk here. But now you no longer have that fraud risk documented. So if you're asked, why is there not a fraud risk here, you would need to just say, well, I did this and this, and I spoke with management, and we looked at the control, and we decided it was not a fraud risk. But where have you documented that information? And the answer is probably nowhere. You, you haven't documented that in the file, and now you've got a problem because the, the, the idea behind documentation in the audit file is that somebody else can come and review the file and come to the same conclusion as you. So they haven't. They think there's a fraud risk. You don't have it documented anyway. So we're just trying to wait, make a way to ensure that documentation is in place in the file where it needs to be. Thereafter, you can then document a procedure for these fraud risks. If you need an alternate procedure, so if you've got different assertions that are needing covering with different procedures, or if, for instance, you want to do a control test and a substantive test of detail, you can document an alternative procedure. And then you can also document exactly which audit program that you want this procedure to fall on. And the reason for the selection is, in this case, I know it's a bit random, but we're saying that revenue and property plant and equipment are the components affected. But now, where are you going to do the procedure? If we put the procedure only on, or, or sorry, if we put the procedure on both, there's a risk that your clerk will go and, or you draw two different clerks doing the two different sections, will both go and try and do the fraud procedure, which is going to be a waste of time. So what we've done is we specify which audit program. We will still put the procedure on both audit programs. So if we open up the property plot and equipment audit program just now, you will see this procedure there, but it will specify that the procedure is to be performed under trade and other receivables. And then as a clerk or as a user, you just simply go and put the hyperlink to the working paper. You don't actually have to go and perform that procedure because it's not part of that, or you're not actually doing it in the PPE audit program. And again, here it's just about making sure that we tie up all the loose ends. You don't want a situation where you look at the fraud risk register, it tells you that there's a fraud risk related to PPE, and you open up the PPE audit program, and there's no procedure to address the fraud. So you, we're just trying to tie up that loose end uh, and make the flow a little bit easier throughout the file. Okay. All right, folks, it's, it's, uh, it's an important step to assess these risks, assess these risks um, also effectively, accurately, because this starts becoming the basis for your file. When you look at their business risk register, uh, similar processes, um, but at the end of the day, that's also going to impact how much work you do on every single one of your audit programs. Okay, now from here, we would go to 1705, which is my audit plan. I'm not going to try and go through that document now. There's a 40 or 50 minute video available on YouTube to take you 
through the detail of the audit plan. But basically what's happening here is we gather all the risks, all the, fr all the business risks specifically, because our fraud risks are already catered for with specific procedures, we only carry at the moment the business risks to the audit plan. And we now need to go and decide on the nature and extent of all procedures or, or, or of the nature and extent of the procedures that we will um, use to address each assertion of each component. That's quite a big matrix. It's quite a big document. That's why I don't want to try and throw it at you at the moment. But it firstly gives you the option to customize that. Say, for instance, I want to go and test controls for the completeness of property plot and equipment. But I, I only want to test substantive tests of detail for the existence of property plot and equipment. And then when you get to your audit program, which we'll look at at the moment, in, in a couple of moments, you'll see how that links through to the audit program itself. There is a shortcut provided, so you can just click a button to assign everything to substantive test of detail, and then go and customize those areas where you want to modify that standard approach. Uh, but it's a pretty comprehensive document. We do go and make sure that the risks that you've identified in the process are all assigned an appropriate uh, level of risk based on your assessment and that those are then carried through appropriately to your audit programs. Let's go and have a look at 30.20 which is my fixed assets and investment property audit program and I want to specifically go and look at my audit procedures. Now the audit program is divided into six sections. Firstly, we have some standard procedures, which you've just got to do. All right, so you can't audit unless you have a lead schedule. You can't audit unless you have an understanding of the accounting policy. So that's the kind of thing that we address in our standard procedures. Then we get to tests of control. And under tests of control, there are no default procedures because it is impossible for me to go and write a procedure for you, for your client. What you would need to do is go and start documenting your own procedure. So let me just go and switch this one off. This is what typically you will see when you open up um, your audit program. You'll pick up that, as I said earlier, we have decided that for the completeness of property, plant and equipment, I want to do a test of control. So I require level one, which is low assurance from control procedures for property plant and equipment. Okay. Now you will also see additions and disposals. I don't want to spend too much time on this. Again, please refer to the video. We're dealing with stratum, so it's separate areas within the file where you need to get additional assurance within that component. So property plant and equipment, the examples we use are additions and disposals, but say trade and other receivables. You could have sundry debtors, staff debtors, you could have um, prepayments, whatever the case might be, there might be other elements that can't be addressed with your normal procedures that you need to go and design new procedures for um, to address those specific uh, stratum as we call them or subcomponents. I'm just going to focus at the moment on the property, plant and equipment line. So I need to document a procedure as I've done here. This procedure could have steps. and then I can link that all together as one procedure by just typing A, B, and C. And then I need to say whether or not I'm going to perform this procedure. I need to say what component this procedure addresses, what assertions this procedure addresses, and the same logic sits here as it does in the risk assessments. What stratum does it address? Is it a specific stratum or all of the stratum? And then what level of assurance? Okay, so if I go and say yes here, you'll see those cells disappear, or the red disappears, because it goes away. The, the one goes away, because I've now addressed that one with a one. Now, it's a bit of a mathematical exercise. We've got four levels of assurance, low, low to moderate, moderate and significant. And each is assigned a numerical value, one, two, three, and four. Now, when I say that I'm going to do this control procedure at level one assurance, it's low, which is, means I'm going to take a small sample size when I do my test. However, if I increase that to a two or a three, my sample size must increase. And we do have sampling methodologies built in which address this requirement to increase the sample size um, so that it 
it will basically ensure that as you uh, as you increase that desired level of assurance, you are getting adequate additional assurance from your procedures. And that's about the most important thing about sampling, is that level of assurance increase means larger sample size, quite simply. Substantive analytical procedures is the third section of the audit program. Again, we can't give you specified procedures, but here are a couple that I've designed already for, um, for this test. So here are my procedures, and uh, you'll see that I'm ending up with minus ones and evaluation and accuracy. Now the reason for that is the assertions that I need covered are completeness, valuation and accuracy, and classification and understandability. But if I go and switch off this procedure, note that the required level of assurance is different for each of those assertions. I've got a 2, a 1, and a 2. Now I've designed one procedure that is able to address all three of those assertions. So when I perform that procedure, I don't want to perform the procedure only at level 1 assurance because then I'm not going to get enough assurance for completeness and classification and understandability. Now if I am in this position, I could choose to do one of two things. I can go and perform another procedure which addresses completeness and classification and understandability, or I could do two more procedures, one for completeness, one for classification and understandability, and do both at a low level of assurance. Or I could just simply go and increase my sample size, or in the case of substantive analytical procedures, as, it, as is the case here, just um, allow a smaller threshold for my analytical procedure, and then I have addressed everything completely. Even though I might, it might look like I'm over auditing, I'm not really, because if I reduce there, I've got to do more work elsewhere. So the minus one is just a potential indicator. It's not a finite, yes, you are over auditing now. It's just something to consider and to make sure that, that you're not missing something along the way. When we get to tests of details, right now we have got a number of suggested procedures in place for you. Now it's important to understand that template procedures are potentially quite dangerous because their wording might be inappropriate for your client. So as you become familiar with RAC, it might become more and more important to just go and change wording on one or two of these procedures for each client um, because there could be variations that, that become critical. However, if you decide you are going to do our procedures, you'll see that the assurance is only documented, or the assertions are only documented on the first line of every procedure. So the expectation is that you're doing the entire procedure to address those assertions. You can't choose, I'm going to do A, D, and F, and think that you're getting the right assurance. You need to do the entire procedure. The other thing that we do, you'll see I've pre-populated this with a desired level of assurance 3. There is an automation available which will automatically go and select all our default procedures but perform them all at a low level of assurance. And what that would do is it would typically go and insert a 1 next to each procedure. However, you'll see that this yes is highlighted under the occurrence existence assertion and the reason is we're carrying that for you from the table below. So this also has a table, but you'll see that there's a red under the occurrence existence. So it's really just there to try and help you spot without having to scroll up and down, which is time consuming and a bit painful at times. You can simply go and decide, well, there's a yes there. Maybe there's a different procedure. There's no others that I can see in a quick scroll. So this is the only procedure that I have addressing the existence of property plant and equipment. So either I must go and do another procedure, design it at the bottom, or I need to go and increase assurance. A two, not enough. Three, now I've got enough. So that cell, that yellow goes away, and I know that for that assertion I have enough assurance. The other thing to be aware of, if you select the default procedures, is that there are some procedures here that are not necessarily going to be applicable to every audit. So there's a procedure here on borrowing costs. 
inspect if borrowing costs were capitalized. Now if you already know that the client has not selected the capital approach to borrowing costs, you automatically will just switch off this procedure. But note that it is addressing assertions. Okay, so we we, we run the risk where if we select, say yes to everything, we're going to start sitting with fairly large negative values. And I just want to scroll to this table, um, and if you can see it, I've got a minus five under the classification and understandability of property plant equipment. Now that could indicate that I'm really over auditing, or it could just be that there are some value add procedures sitting in here that I still want to perform. So let's go and have a look. There's one somewhere here on insurance policy. Okay, here's a procedure. Inspect the insurance policy and determine that property plant equipment is adequately insured. If not adequate, consider going concern risk. Okay, now depending on the client that you're at, this might be a very valuable procedure to perform. Does your client actually carry enough insurance? If your client is struggling, it sometimes seems like a good idea to stop paying insurance because that can save a bit of money each month. But that could have massive going concern problems. If something goes wrong, if there's a fire, that's the end of the business. It's gone. There's no way that they will recover. So depending on the client, you might decide that this is or isn't a valuable procedure to perform. If I go and say no to this procedure, it's under rights and obligations and uh, I scroll to my table, there's no reds, okay? So I can skip that procedure and still get enough assurance, but I might still want to perform that procedure. So there's a bit of a judgment call going on here. Um, you need to decide um, per entity sometimes what is appropriate, what's not. The risk is, and it happened to me many times, we had an audit program that had a procedure which basically said go and recalculate the rehabilitation provision. So sitting at a school and we're auditing the file and there's this procedure and uh, three hours into the day the clock comes to me and says well they've, they've been trying all morning to understand this procedure. How do you, what's a rehabilitation provision? Well a rehabilitation provision has nothing to do with a school. It's not an applicable procedure. But time was wasted because that procedure was on the audit program. So I messed up. I should have said no, um, take it off, delete it before they got the audit program. And that's what we're trying to do with RAC. We want to get, um, get auditors in, in, into the practice of choosing procedures before the audit commences, Choose a, doing the planning before the audit commences because that will now impact what happens in the file. And at the end of the day, you're sitting in a situation with RAC where these little numbers at the bottom here are conclusive proof that you have designed appropriate procedures to at the end of the day address the risks that you have in the file. Because as you raise risks, the required number here will increase. And you might choose to do it via um, analytical procedures or tested details or part of it under controls. That's up to you, but it, it's going to be linked to um, to those risks every step of the way. There's a thread that's going to run all the way through back to where you documented your knowledge of the business and decided what level of risk is appropriate. All right, just to show you, um, here is the procedures related to fraud risks. I wanted to point out that it is saying there to be performed under trade and other receivables, so that pulls through quite nicely. Okay, all right, then it's telling me here, planning has been completed adequately, and that's just proving to me that all of these cells have been cleared, there's no red items left, I have appropriately planned procedures. What you would do from here is there's a planning sign-off document, so once you've selected all the procedures in all, this, in all the components, you come to 18.00, now have a look here, next to Fixed assets and investment property, it tells me planning completed adequately. Tax, planning does not comply with the audit plan. So in other words, I still need to go and select the right procedures under taxation. Let's just go and make this a yes, this is just a sign off 
which switches the audit program into something we call execution mode. And what happens now is only the procedures you've selected are still going to be shown in the file. There's no more a selection about which components and assertions, it's just listed for you. And your team can now start going and put in, in hyperlinks to reference where the work was done. And at the end of the day, just deleting the response here, it's asking you, was the test successfully carried out and the desired level of assurance obtained? And you can now go and sign off procedures, document that um, you've achieved the required. If the procedure fails, you would need to go and put in a no. When that happens, I'm just going to take you to the bottom here, we've got a conclusion that now pops up, big yellow area, all right, property, plant and equipment, we're missing some assurance. I wanted to get level three assurance here, it's gone, it's not available anymore. I need to go and do more to address this. And so we've got a whole change in audit approach available, where you can now go and document what you're doing to address the, these assertions at the end of the day, hopefully to come to a result that there's no more outstanding assurance. However, if there is still remaining assurance, you can then go and document what impact will this have on my um, report. Okay, just have a look at the conclusion here. It tells me execution of procedures has not addressed all risks and the change in audit approach has not uh, resolved outstanding insurance matters. Sorry, that's cut off on the side. However, if I come back here and I reinstitute this procedure, I go back to my file, change in audit approach completed adequately. It then goes to a final summary document in the finalization, which is, you just scroll down, here's my fixed asset investment property. It's telling me here that execution has not addressed all risks, but change in audit approach completed adequately and the document is signed off. So if there are still problems, you will immediately see this as a reviewer, this is the final audit sign of control sheet. If you see something's wrong here, you know there's outstanding work or I need to be sure that I've gone and raised the appropriate qualification in my audit report at the end of the day. Okay. All right, I'm not going to go through details of the finalization documents. There are some nice working papers in there um, that will make life um, a lot easier um, when assessing things like going concern, subsequent events. It's taking you through the decision trees to decide whether or not something exists. For instance, reportable irregularities. Is there actually a reportable irregularity? Document the circumstances. Laws and regulations. That's all about when do I need to report? Who do I report to? Uh, there's a working paper specifically on key audit matters. Um, the new ISA 701 requires key audit matters to be disclosed in certain circumstances. So does it apply to me? That, that's the first question and that's, that's how the working paper is structured to first go and decide whether or not it applies and if it does, what do you need to document? Um, and then there's this, like, like I open now, this audit control sign-off sheet, which I think is a great place to review from because you can go and confirm each line item as you're happy, as the audit partner maybe, with each section um, and you can move on from there. All right, I want to show you um, the, the sampling template as well. I just want to quickly scroll through any of the questions that there might be. Um, I, don't, I see there are not too many, Damien, so I'm not going to try and uh, pop them up. Um, first one I've addressed, which is uh, the correct way of adding new components. Um, is, the able, is the user able to override the considerations in white colored cells or the guidance procedures in the gray colored cells? Okay, so um, the important question is, and maybe it's a bad example, um, I'm just putting a value in here. Many of the cells that are white, as well as the cells that are gray, are locked in the same way that the financial statements are locked. Now, if you've got that manager password and you know what you're doing or if you feel that the response you're getting is not appropriate, you're more than welcome to override, log in and, and override the values. Um, it, it's really up to you, it's professional judgment. 
but we have just locked it so that it's not anybody who can do it. It is somebody who has that manager password that um, needs to um, do that override if they if they want to. Okay. Um, uh, question about whether this is accounting or auditing. This is definitely auditing. So today's session was all about RAC, which is an audit methodology. And um, there's a question about financial instruments. How would you go about performing the audit using the software? All right. So that is basically the process. When you've selected those financial instruments under 10.20, there are a number of financial instruments listed, shareholder loans and um, various investments. Those financial instruments then get allocated to a cycle. So you would have, there is, I think it's 31 or 32 is investments. It's not visible at the moment. In fact, we can see under the lead schedule. So there's loan and investments, uh, 33, and then there are borrowings and interest expense. Uh, which is section 50. So the various financial instruments are going to be categorized into those cycles and then you would go to that appropriate audit program once you've generated the audit programs and choose either the default procedures that we have there if they're appropriate and, and if they are available or you would go and then design those procedures that you feel are required to address the assertions in the audit um, for each of those components. So Basically what we were doing in 30.20, uh, you go and select the procedures or add the procedures, but assessing the risks, all of that still happens in section 11 and 12, or well, identifying in 11 and 12, assessing in 15 and 16, allocating those in 17, and then actually implementing them into the various audit programs. All right, so we spoke a bit about sampling, and I just wanna go and open up our sampling template. Now, if you're not a RAC user, um, the, you will not have seen this document before if you've not uh, watched one of our videos or attended a previous uh, webinar. Uh, what we've gone and done is we've created a template to try and make sampling as easy as possible. So what you would do is open up this template, um, you would go save as, although I'll show you in a couple of moments um, one of the adjustments that we've made to that, and you would go and then document um, what components are being addressed by the sample. So your audit program would um, be, um, it would say go and draw a sample from expenses and cost of sales and trace to the supporting documents and inspect the following on the invoice for instance. That might be your procedure. So you just simply go and select the components that you want to audit and then we go here to the sample size calc sheet. Now here you would go and select a materiality with some drop downs and then it goes and lists for um, each of the components you've selected what the level of assurance required is based on 17.05. So in 17.05 we said there's a significant risk for the completeness of cost of sales. All right. You now need to decide what assertions am I testing and this you would also this just comes straight off your audit program because um, you would know is it occurrence existence valuation accuracy and in this case I've also selected classification and understandability so you just select the appropriate assertions it then just as a double check goes and sees what's the highest that I should be performing this procedure at if I decide to do this procedure at a significant level of assurance, I'm probably over auditing because there is no significant requirement in the items that I've selected. But my audit program will give me the detail. It will tell me in this case that I need to do low to moderate assurance. Now I've got two versions of this template. This is the Pastel GL version. We've also got another one for other layouts. But Pastel Partner, Pastel Express, when you export that GL to Excel, it's a pretty common layout um, and for that reason we've gone and designed a template specifically to try and assist you with those. So if I go to the pastel sheet, I've already done it, um, but here is, it's about 7,000 line items and if you're familiar with pastel, this layout should look pretty um, familiar to you. It's got the account number and it says opening balance and it's got the transactions and the various transactions that take place. Okay.
Okay, so you simply go and value paste the GL um, into this working paper, and then we can go to this population check sheet. And what we do here is we go through the items that you've just pasted into this pastel sheet and check that the values actually agree to the trial balance. What's the risk? Let me go and delete a line item here. All right, let's say we had an incomplete GL. I go back to the pastel check and you'll see that it's not matching the trial balance, which means I've got the wrong general ledger, which means I need to go back to the client and find out, do I need a new trial balance? In other words, have you gone and processed stuff without telling us? Or have you given me the wrong GL to try and delete things that you don't want me to find? What's the situation? It's hugely frustrating, and I can speak from experience as an audit manager, where um, somebody spends hours and hours and hours designing a sample, and they come back, and the sample doesn't agree to the trial balance uh, or, or the population, and, and you kind of think, well, that, that was a waste of time. So this is there to go and try and just make sure that you match the values appropriately. Just go and put this value back, and magically that population check will now work. Okay, and now you can also go and select exactly which line items or which GL items you actually want to include in the sample. You don't need to go and copy each general ledger account individually. You can take an entire range, and I took everything from 2,000 to 5,000, but now I need to go and tell it I don't want to audit these items, and I don't want to audit wages because that sits under payroll. I don't want to audit other income. That I audit under um, revenue, for instance, whatever the case might be. So I'm going to select exactly which GL accounts I need to include in the sample, and I can go back to my sample size calc. Sorry, before I do that, you also have the ability to go and select certain key items. So for whatever reason, I want to select this item specifically, if, if there's any particular reason for you to do that. You also have the option here to select, are you going to sample from the debit items, the credit items, or both? Please use both very, very carefully. If you're testing expenses and your procedure says draw a sample of invoices from the general ledger, you can't say both because the credit items are returns and it's a completely different procedure that you need to perform. Whereas if you're selecting from, say, the debtor's age analysis, you might have balances in credit on your debtor's age analysis because the guy's overpaid. That's fine. Then you can select both and we will make a sample of the absolute values to ensure that that credit balance also has an opportunity to be selected. Okay, sample size calc. It tells me my population is 103 million, but it tells me the value as per the lead should be 97 million. So the balance on the financial statements that I'm testing is 97 million. But the population is 103, and that's because I'm only selecting debit amounts. And that 97 is a net amount. So I've got to audit the gross of 103 here, and I've got to somewhere else go and test that 6 million of credit balances with another procedure. That's for returns, it might be a big journal, Whatever the case might be, I can't ignore that 6 million, but my population here is 103 million. And it consists of 3,446 line items. Now, based on my materiality of 900,000, the template has already gone and figured out that there are two items totaling 1.8 million that are material items. So immediately, we select material items. Then it goes and says, well, what are key items I selected? So there are the three key items, and they total 70, um, 76,000. All right. Now I have a remaining population of 101 million, 3,441 line items. I need to go and insert a random number. You can use the Excel random generator using that equals rand, open and close the brackets. Okay, but then please value paste the answer that you get because otherwise every time you change a value the random number changes and so does your sample, which could be a problem if you've gone and already asked your client for all the invoices and then suddenly you open up the sampling working paper and all those invoices are gone. All right. We've also then got a couple of questions about audit qualification in the last five years and uh, the overall 
control environment being effective in the entity. And the reason for this is because we've applied something called a maximum, suggested maximum sample size, which we only want to apply in lower risk clients. If you've got a client that's had frequent qualifications or doesn't have a good control environment, we're a bit hesitant to apply this maximum sample size. Okay, size of the entity is determined by the PIS score and it's also used as a factor uh, in determining sample size. All right, so now it's going and calculating my sample size. 101 million divided by materiality times a R factor or a risk factor. So that R factors that we use is 1 for low, 1.6 for low to moderate, 2.3 for moderate and 3 for significant risks. And that's just basically a risk multiplier. We multiply your determined sample size by this value um, just to increase that sample size to increase the level of assurance. So if I go and I select here significant, you will note that that R is now 3 and the calculation of sample size comes to 337. Suggested maximum is 60. Whereas if I go back to a low to moderate, I come up with a value of 40. So even the suggested maximum is moving. And depending on the size of the entity, it's going to move as well. All right. Suggested maximum sample size. Um, we presented this methodology, the, the and specifically the sampling methodology to Erba. And uh, at that time, the maximum that we came to in terms of suggested max was 100 items for large, high-risk client with significant uh, assurance required from the sample. And Erba's only comment to us about the methodology was, why is that maximum so high? So we have reduced that, and that's why you saw 60 is now our maximum. But in this case, 40. So we're saying that instead of selecting 180 items, you can limit that sample size to 40, but you have the option here to select an amount. So you could say 45, just give a reasoning at the end of the day as to why you're selecting it. You cannot select 35, it's going to give you an error. Okay, so I'm going to stick to 40, and then through the magic of uh, formulas, I go to my sample testing sheet. Here are my two material items, totaling 1.8 million. Here are my three key items, totaling that 76,000. And without anything else needing to be done, here are my 40 sampled items using monetary unit sampling, totaling 7 million already selected for me. Okay, and um, if I change the random number, the sample will change as well. So this is, it's dynamic, um, it automatically pulls these values for you, there's no need to go and manually select. Here are the items, and this even goes further to include a working paper, it'll have various drop-downs available for you, you can document the procedure in this procedure detail sheet. So you would just go and document what procedures you're doing for occurrence, valuation, and classification. And uh, use a drop-down for a tick, or you need to make a comment. Go to the legend, use the legend to document items. And if you find errors, this working paper will even extrapolate those errors for you as well. All right, so we're covering you throughout the sampling process. Um, and it ends up giving you an extrapolation sheet here that you can then go and capture that journal. Okay, sure. I hope, I hope you guys like that. If you haven't seen this before, it's a fantastic little template. All right. Um, does some wonderful stuff. Um, so, yeah, if you, if you haven't used Rack, gosh, the, the money you pay for Rack is almost uh, recovered just by being able to do these automated sampling items. It really is a fantastic tool. Um, that I certainly love using, um, and I'm sure if you got into it, you would love using it as well. All right, I'm just quickly in the background opening up another uh, Draftworks file here, because we are about to release uh, an update, hopefully still this week, otherwise early next week, which is going to bring in a few new template tools into Draftworks. So I just want to show you, just need to have a working paper open. 
previously, if you were in Rack and you open up this Rack tab, you would just have the populate audit programs um, sitting in there. What we've done is uh, we've developed a little toolbar in here where a lot of the templates that would have sat here in section 18 and 19, okay, so they are still in this file. Uh, after the update, future Rack files that you create won't contain all of these working papers in section 19, but rather they'll be sitting under additional templates. And if you want the working paper, you can go and select the item and add it to your working paper. And by, it's really simple. You just click on the item, it opens it up, you give it a section reference and say which folder you want to put it in and say input to rack file. And uh, there you go, there's my 20.20 .20 test. It's included in the audit file for me. So no longer do we have 20 or 30 documents that you need to go and mark as not applicable in each audit. We've now covered that with this template generation. Also, what is going to fall away in the audit programs is uh, under section 20, the sampling templates are moving. All right, and we now have manual sampling. All right, so that's if you want to just determine the sample size. But there's auto sampling for controls, and you'll see that we have a number of different file sizes. So we have, if you've got about 5,000 line items in your GL, all the way to 100,000 line items in your GL that you need to paste in. And that's available for uh, control sampling, for the other population items, as well as the pastel items for substantive sampling. Right? The guidance documents for sampling are sitting under the sampling guidance. And then we've also gone and just created a nice little template for you in landscape or portrait. Um, so I just want to show you that input rack file. And go to 20.20. .20. There's my landscape test. And it's just a little working paper with all the formulas and stuff built in for you. Um, it's similar to this create, old create working paper document, but we've just colored it to look like the rack uh, templates as well. So I hope that um, that also excites you guys. Uh, so that's under the rack tab. Just need to go back to a rack document for the rack tab to show. All right, estate management affairs boards as well. If you are auditing an estate agent, we used to have section 29 in all our rack files. It's now not going to be in all rack files. So you don't have to go and mark that as not applicable anymore. All right, folks, so the time is uh, catching up with us. I just want to see there are a couple of additional questions. Um, right, so the first one is about how the methodology is maintained for changes in the standards, laws, and or regulations. Okay, so what, what we are, we're actually... Um, going to be doing a, um, a revamp of some of our working papers in the next couple of months. Um, firstly, if you haven't heard about it, we are working on a cloud version. So the first thing we need to do is we want to modernize and improve these working papers to work better on our cloud platform. It will still work on desktop, but we just, we, we're looking at improvements to make it work even better on, on our cloud. Um, and in that process, what we've done is we have got a comprehensive listing of all of the ISAs um, and exactly where each of those ISAs is addressed in our audit programs. Sorry, I just want to kill the phone. Um, now, with that, um, when the ISAs change, we can very quickly and easily go through the changes and see exactly where in the file we need to go and make changes to our rack documentation. Okay, so what we did is we've set up this comprehensive checklist, um, and um, we've used some of the stuff that were inv involved in the um, uh, in the design and the writing of rack uh, to actually go through again. Let's go through those ISAs once again, and let's go and make sure that we're tying up any potential loose ends. Um, so we do constantly, we will be working on, on, on updating and improving. So for instance, um, 
key audit matters, for instance, is a fairly new template. It only popped out um, as a result of the changes recently, um, but um, that's a new working paper and it's been included because key audit matters is a new thing that's come in. All right. Um, there's a question about here that I find the working papers are not printer friendly. Um, is there a way of addressing this when you need to print out the audit file for things like external reviews, practice reviews, etc. Okay. All right. Yeah. Unfortunately, some of the documents are pretty pretty large, and especially that 1505, 1605. Um, what we will be doing when we do the next update is we're going to adjust the layouts on a few of our working papers to try and address this where we can. Um, basically, what's what's um, What's happening is it's getting too wide, and and therefore it's it's struggling to scale. So we've we've got a proof of concept ready um, to be able to scale the thing, uh, or to scale our working papers differently, those big ones. So we will be working on addressing that in the near future. Okay, um, is there an Arabic version of DraftWorks? Yes, there is. Uh, if you can please drop an email to info at draftworks.com. Um, we will uh, will gladly assist you and give you details of our Arabic version of DraftWorks. And then uh, compliance evaluation. Um, so we are, have had a number of reviews by Urba uh, already um, and the feedback has been quite good. Um, guys are passing their file reviews um, having used Rack. So we're quite confident that there are uh, th that the, the methodology is of a good quality, of a good standard. Um, what, we, um, what we can't do is give you an assurance that if you use Rack, you will pass a review because it does require your own knowledge, skills and understanding to be applied correctly in the file. So the fact that the, these firms are passing their reviews is not just because Rack is great, it's also because those firms are responsible and understand their eyes as well. So it's not just because you use Rack you will pass, um, but yes, we have had those, um, we have had files reviewed. Uh, we um, are constantly making little updates and changes when clients are requesting various things. Um, what you see in a Rack, yes, it was originally written by Protector Partner, but we're also expanding and improving on it over time. Um, as, as people give us comments or thoughts or suggestions, uh, we do like to include uh, whatever we can. All right. All right, Earl, I don't know if you are still on here. I don't know if you want to um, talk any further. Um, Thank you so much for, for that session. Um, there, there's a last question from Murad. Uh, can we have an overview of the financial statements and their compliance with IFRS? Um, Murad, we'll, we'll be hosting a session later on, it'll probably be in early October, when we'll be doing an overview of the financial statements again. Just in terms of our IFRS financials, what the, the team has done, which is remarkable, is that there is a built-in checklist um, in our new AFS Plus financial statements where we actually go and we cross-reference uh, all the compliance items so you can relatively easily demonstrate your compliance uh, that you have applied when you do issue your, your financial statements and of course it then also shows off our compliance that there is a checklist built in um, for the IFRS standards so from in, in terms of that we, we are compliant again as Leon said, it is still up to you to ensure that you follow that uh, compliance checklist um, and you apply your, your professional knowledge to, to complete it. But we will be issuing an email shortly with those upcoming webinar dates. Um, yes, I, I think the, the best thing is just to mention, guys, we are built for our clients and we do do changes. We we basically engineer DraftWorks for our users. So if there is anything that you see that can be improved upon or anything that is currently not in DraftWorks and you would like in DraftWorks, then please just drop us a line, let us know how we can improve. 
Um, it's really as simple as that. But we are bringing out quite a few new items um, early in January 2018. One of them, the, the much hopped um, and talked about DraftWorks Cloud. It's in has been in development for a long time. Uh, we just want to provide you the best solution possible in the world and uh, we're very comfortable that we have achieved that and we're just finalizing some of the last items uh, for the cloud uh, deployment and then of course we'll also be launching an additional service uh, it's currently it's named sync uh, that's coming in january 2018 and we'll be posting more updates about that and what exactly this product entails as we get closer to the year end but we're extremely excited about it why because I think we think it's going to change your life. Um, so yes, we, we're very, very um, excited about that. Um, okay, Leo, uh, anything further from from you? Uh, just a, a last apology for the for the technical issue we had earlier. I do see that everybody was able to get on. There may be one or two guys. If anyone was disrupted, we will be issuing a video um, of the session. So if you didn't miss anything through that technical glitch, then not to worry, you'll be able to catch up. So we'll we'll get on producing that video ASAP. All right. Yeah, so Earl, I've just quickly popped up that uh, checklist from our new IFRS financials. Um, oh, beautiful. Yeah, so um, you'll see here that we've gone and incorporated all of the paragraphs out of the IFRS standards where disclosure is requ required into the template itself. And uh, every paragraph has got a hyperlink to show you exactly where in the file that paragraph is documented. So in terms of compliance, um, in terms of IFRS compliance, I think we've 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 got it nailed. Um, we've we've really got an example disclosure for virtually everything. Uh, again, it's important to note that not always will one disclosure be right for every entity. Uh, so there are going to be times when you need to adjust that disclosure slightly, uh, but um, the, the, at least the guidance is right there. You don't need to go and refer to the reference material. There it is. There's the disclosure requirements. There's another question about RAC being fully integrated with the new IFRS for SME Plus template. Yes, we have sent out updates. Uh, the last update we've sent, I think, um, incorporated updated templates um, for RAC, which then had all the right balances and things pulling through uh, to the methodology. Um, but other than the balances, there's not really any carryover between the framework and the methodology. So in terms of everything else, it, it, it is fully compliant and, and ready to go. If you are opening up older files that you created uh, with RAC and one of our new uh, AFS Plus templates, and you're seeing values are not correct on things like 10.20, those components, or 11.25, which is your prelim analytical, um, please contact support. We can just quickly replace those files for you uh, from from template, um, and that should assist you going forward. Leon, there's one more question uh, with regards to financial instruments. How would you go about performing the audit using the software? Oh, we we did, oh, sorry, I did address that a little bit earlier. It was just selecting the appropriate oh, okay. items in 10.20 and running through. Thanks, uh, thanks, Damien. Perfect. Thank you. All right, folks, from our side, thanks very much uh, for joining us. Um, any further questions, please uh, hop onto remote support or send us uh, emails at support at uh, draftworks.com. Gladly assist you. But otherwise, um, thanks very much from our side. Have a fantastic day further. Hope you guys enjoy your long weekend. Um, make a, uh, yeah, have a good one. Thanks very much. Lovely. Thank you, everybody. I think we'll be ending the session now. And as Leon said, any queries, any, any way we can assist, please just contact us. It's our absolute pleasure. Okay. Lovely. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day.